Welcome to Paranormal Almanac. With your host, Kurt Sandvig. That's right, I'm your host, Kurt Sandvig, and on this edition of Paranormal Almanac, let's talk some more about curses. But first, as always, we have shout-outs. That's right, shout-outs going out to Spencer, Ricardo, Vicky, Christopher, Vanessa, Marisol, Liam, Isabeth, Dusty, Roger, Michael, Matthew, Ali- Alicia, Eric, Becca, Joshua, Elizabeth, Wojtek, Sherry, Art Muffin, Trudy, Tim, Paul, Re- Ricardo, Damian, and Daniel, Ian, Eric, Brandon, Jen, Alexandra, Simon, George, Connie, Seth, Jason, Cindy, Kim, Ashley, what's that? Ian, Carrie, Ezram, Robin, Will, Kelly, Lauren, and Phil Mangano, Russell, Tanya, Donald, Chris, Jones, April, Seth, Isabel, Audra, Dorian, Cindy, Bob, the Jean Bishop, Cole, Paula, Jerry, Leo, Scoston, I'll just say Austin, Scoston, Lindsay Hahn, Megan, Jeff, Jeff T, Aaron, Harley, Suzanne, Joe, Lauren, Lawrence, Lauren McCune, hey howdy hi, Autumn, J Mark, Manning, Carolyn, Martin, Darth Pikachu, Jade, Nanashi, Heidi, Kira, Chuck, Todd, Jamie, and Elijah Hendrickson, Juliana, Dan, Dill, Laura Pitts, and Gamer Fan. With a special shout out, as always, to Joe Teague and Stitch. This episode is produced by Chris Jones. All right, let's get right on into paranormal news because we got a bunch of it. Just in case you guys don't grasp the concept of these episodes, as it appears some people do not, the show is not just about the topic, curses. The show is also about paranormal news. Why? Because it's new, it's news, and it's my podcast. So, figure it out. Alrighty, first up in paranormal news. What time is it? It's time for paranormal news. What happened when I wore a cursed crystal for a week? That's weird. It's almost like it's what this show is about today. That's right. There are horror stories about a Moldavite, Moldavite? Sure. On TikTok that have people believing that it'll turn your life upside down. So I put it to the test. This was, I thought was an actually an interesting one. When Moldavite sales skyrocketed, is it really called Moldavite? It's a weird name. When Moldavite sales skyrocketed over the past year, Michelle Ferris knew right away that it was because of TikTok. For a long time before TikTok, it was not a popular except among specific collectors. So she bought one of these necklaces in the world of crystal healing. Moldavite is tektite, known for heralding powerful transformations that will invite things into people's lives and put people on their highest paths. And in case you guys don't know, uh, TikTok trends, yeah, they're out there. They're crazy. So let's start a TikTok trend of getting people to, I don't know, listen to Paranormal Almanac or buy some merch or something instead of buying stupid crap like this or doing milk crate, whatever the hell that thing is. Challenges? Whatever. All right, so she bought the, um, the Moldavite. She started wearing it. She experienced a huge surge of energy, she said. Apparently, this feeling is so common that there's a name for it. A Moldavite flush. Guess what? I'm going to buy Moldavite. I'm going to try it and see if I get the same flush. The purported power of Moldavite may be how it gained its initial traction on TikTok. Blah, blah, blah. Stephanie Porth, uh, uh, a student in New York, posted a video. It's been six months she started wearing the ring. Her dog died, and she lost some important people in her life. Never mind. I am not buying it. The uh, video racked up 3.5 million views, uh, rattled some dog owners. Yep, I don't blame her. But she doesn't actually think that the Moldavite is cursed. She noted that a lot of people saw her video as a negative thing, but they don't understand the situation that's surrounding it. Uh, She said it serves as a purpose for introducing more positive things into her life. Her family adopted a rescue dog, and she made a new friend. Okay, but still your dog died. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I no longer... I agree. It's a curse. Uh, She said, Moldavite's getting a bad reputation. It's also kind of my fault, and I do feel bad about it. No more boyfriend, she declared in tears. That video is viewed 6.8 million times. No more parent, she announced when her, um, when one of her parents died. She was standing in front of a hearse. Stop TikToking on a freaking, at a funeral. Uh, She said that she had a, um, she was having a breakdown in her car after ending things with her boyfriend. 
So she was like, yep, this is it. The Moldavite is cursed. So she whipped out her phone, made a TikTok video about it. Uh, it was her stepfather's passing. After her videos blew up, she found herself having to explain her videos about Moldavites, not actually jinked. She said her stepfather's health had been deteriorating because of brain cancer and her relationship had been facing circumstantial challenges. She's like, you know, I'm not going to read the rest of it. So uh, basically, so this, this reporter said, all right, let's find out because of this Moldavite curse, is it actually cursed or is it circumstantial? Which is a lot of things that happen with curses. And you'll hear about that on today's episode. So she said day one, nothing. Day two, she kicked a frog. She went for a run and she kicked a frog. Okay, that's weird. Day three, nothing. Uh, da, 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 da. Day four, friends talked about COVID with her. Day five, it's COVID. So basically, I'm going to skip ahead. So basically, she wore it for a while and she found out that it's all about the mindset and what you get out of your sessions when you're using your crystals or wearing your crystals. If you have something that you think can either bring luck or change, and you start to notice luck or change, that's just that's just a logical mindset. It's like to me saying to you guys right now, keep a mind, keep an, while you're listening to this episode, for the next week, keep an eye out for red cars. Keep an eye out for red cars. You're going to start noticing more and more red cars because I put that in your mind. You're going to start, you have that in the back of your mind to notice red cars. So you're going to notice them. So are curses just circumstantial? You hear about something, you it's called a curse. You start to wonder, is the curse real? You start to think about the curse and then you start to notice things happening in your life. Good shit and bad shit happens in your life all the time. You can't attribute all of it to a curse. Now, that being said, there are some uh, stories on this episode that have a predominant amount of bad things happening all at once. So maybe, maybe there are curses, but not everything that could be a curse is a curse. All right, moving on in paranormal news. Is the ancient Egyptian mummy's curse real? This one came out 11 days ago. The idea of a mummy's curse actually precedes King Tut's discovery. It goes on to talk about the discovery of King Tut's tomb in 1922. Uh, I've actually talked full and well about King Tut's tomb's curse, so I'll move on. Uh, They said that um, the pharaoh's 3,000-year-old curse is seen in illnesses in carnivons. I don't know what that means. The uh, similar headlines appeared in newspapers around the world as news broke of the illness and the curse and the death. Uh, He suffered an infection that reportedly resulted from a shaving accident while he cut a bite mark made by a mosquito. And it just goes on to talk about his death. So basically, the notion of a curse may sound ridiculous, but it's been studied seriously by scientists. This is the important part. With several papers published on the topic, in an effort to determine whether a long-lived pathogen could have caused the curse... Science used mathematical modeling to determine how long a pathogen could survive inside a tomb. Now, this was done twice. It's been done in 1996 and 1998. And indeed, oh, Lord Carnival. Oh, there we go. Okay. And in, indeed, his death after entering the tomb of Tutankhamun could potentially be explained by an infection with a highly virulent and very long-lived pathogen. So... Yeah, there is something to it. There were deaths associated with King Tut and other tombs, and you're going to hear about that on today's episode. And science says, is is it a curse because someone talked about it and then the death happened? Or did the death happen because of something scientific? Even today, some people link archaeological discoveries and contemporary events with curses, when a, math, when a massive 2,000-year-old coffin was found in Alexandria in 2018, some people feared that opening it could unleash a curse. Similarly, when a ship blocked the Suez Canal in 2021, some people tried to place the blame on mummies, noting that, noting that the mummies of several ancient Egyptian pharaohs were set to be transported to a museum in Fustat. People want life to have meaning and not be chaotic or random or coincidental. Traditionally, Formal religion has supplied that need to explain the existence, but many people have turned to magical and supernatural beliefs, and in these include curses. So again, it's that cause and effect kind of a thing. People are looking for a reason for bad things to happen. 
The curses, especially King Tut's tomb and the deaths surrounding it, are real. People died. Those were real deaths. They were really caused by opening King Tut's tomb. But not necessarily a curse because science knows why they died. All righty, up next in paranormal news, not a curse, but man claims to have captured the biggest sighting ever of the Loch Ness Monster, not a monster, on film. One real-life monster hunter claims thee as the best evidence yet of the existence of the Loch Ness Monster. Ian Ian O'Fadigan, which I've talked about before, has released a 38-second clip of a shape floating around the surface of the Scottish Lake. The Nessie spotters confirmed confirmed his sightings with the official Loch Ness Monster, Monster Sightings Register. I've talked about that before. But I want to actually watch the video. Uh, it's the lock. Video has no sound. It's a big black mass in the lock. So far, nothing exciting is happening with the big black mass. Time lapsed to another Part of the video, same thing. It is a huge black mass in the lock. I'm not saying it's not. Oh, wait. All right. That is kind of weird. It does kind of look like it dipped down under the water. I might have to add this actual video to the Facebook page. See what you guys think about this. It's almost over. I mean, oh, it is under. And it did go under. It goes right under, right at the end. All right, there is something weird. I don't know what the hell it is because it's just a big black blob in the water, but it does go underwater right at the end. All right, that's interesting enough. I'll throw that on the Facebook page. I can't say that I just saw um, Nessie, but I will say that that was that was interesting. That was really interesting. All righty, up next in Paranormal News... The Definitive Guide to Denver International Airport's Biggest Conspiracy Theories. Now, I did an episode about this one before. Um, and actually, I've been to the uh, airport since I did the episode. But there's a whole thing about all of the weird conspiracy theories with the Denver International Airport. If you don't know it, find the episode, listen to it, because it is very bizarre. All right, it says sinister sculptures, secret bunkers, swastika-shaped runways, and murals that point to a new world order, takeover, or alien invasion. What about those gargoyles? That's right, conspiracy theories about Denver International Airport have soared for more than two decades. Um, They predate even the airport's 1995 debut, but the airport doesn't seem to mind the weird publicity surrounding it. They say that we have a CEO who really embraces the conspiracy ideas. We decided a few years ago that rather than fight all this and try and convince everyone that there's nothing really going on, let's have some fun with it. So they did. They uh, started setting up a bunch of weird, random crap in the actual airport itself. Um, But he said most of the theories are laughable, easily disproved. It's happy to weaponize them as a marketing tool, but hundreds or thousands of even millions of dollars in free publicity for the airport is always good. But some of these pictures aren't even of our airport. People see it out of context, and then it confuses. It continues the dialogue. YouTube is a big propagator of this. There's been so much misinformation out there that people just regurgitate it and spout it without thinking or addressing the reality behind it. Hey, that's what I say all the time. So they talk about the secret societies, the artistic clues to the apocalypse, the underground bunkers and aliens, the Nazi runways and remote locations, and uh, the conclusion. Here we go. I'm going to put it all up on, on the Facebook page, but conclusion, no matter what you do, you lose. You show people the tunnels and explain the symbols, you lose. You clam up and deny it, you lose. So that's why we started to have fun with these, because people are going to believe what they believe, regardless of hard evidence. So I'll put this up on the Facebook page as well, so you guys can read all about it in case you didn't know. I didn't know anything about the um, the Nazi runways. I don't remember talking about that on the episode. So apparently there's even more to the Denver airport than I even knew. All righty, last but not least. Actually, no, there's a YouTube video I want to watch uh, real quick. Well, second to last. Italy. Flat earthers seek edge of the world, but end up on the island off Sicily. That's right. A couple ended up in Eustica, 
after breaking COVID-19 lockdown. A pair of flat earther enthusiasts, by the way, uh, the earth is round, uh, from northern Italy set sail from Sicily with the intentions of reaching the remote island of Lampedusa, which for them represented the edge of a flat world. Why? I don't know. Um, this is according to a re, uh, an Italian newspaper. Too bad for the couple, a middle-aged man and woman. They undertook the escapade in full lockdown, breaking the COVID-19 travel restrictions. And the story, which only comes to light today, reveals that the hapless pair reached the northern North Sicilian port of Termini. Termini, I don't know, something. They, it's a port. Where they sold their car and they bought a boat. From there, they set sail for um, Palermo, but uh, not remote. Oh, they set sail, but ended up instead on the island of Eustica and not remotely near the island of Lampedusa, which is located to the far south of uh, Sicily. Shocking. They're really bad at this. The disoriented pair arrived in the harbor of uh, saying they were tired, thirsty, and risking shipwreck. The funny thing is that they oriented themselves with a compass, an instrument that works on the basis of terrestrial magnetism a principle that they, as flat earthers, should refuse, said a doctor at the Maritime Department of Ministry of Health. Yeah, and he's right. So the uh, the couple uh, didn't get anywhere near the edge of the world. In fact, they didn't even get to where they were trying to go. They flat out failed. Sorry, flat earthers. Another loser attempt at uh, proving that the earth is not Round, but it is. It really is. All righty, last up in paranormal news, the massive Idaho Bigfoot on video. All righty. So this was sent to me. Holy shit. All right. There's, it's a video of a ginormous Bigfoot. Yep. But what is it? Two seconds long? Why does it keep repeating the same two seconds? You actually going to show the full video? Now it's in slow-mo for those two-second clip. So it's a two-second clip of a Bigfoot walking. Uh-huh. I mean, it's a great Bigfoot costume. But I can't say it's a Bigfoot because it seems to be two seconds long. They seem to use... There we go. This was filmed in Idaho, USA. We're not sure why it's only a few seconds as this was sent to us this way. Watch very closely the way it walks. You can see it walks like Patty. The build is also very similar to her. And look at the body. Yeah, all right. It's obviously a clip, a two-second clip of a Bigfoot walking. So there's more to this video. Why that wasn't, why there's only this two seconds, repeat on repeat on repeat on repeat. Now, I'm calling bullshit until we see more of the video. There, It's just too fishy. It, it was sent to them anonymously. No, I'm not buying any of it. All righty, with that. Let's close up the paranormal news and let's move on. Oh, actually, let's take a quick break. We'll be right back in just a second. We are back. All righty, we are back. Before we get into this episode, once again, I do have a P.O. box. There's a lot of people that asked about a P.O. box. I've actually already gotten some very nice cards and gifts. I'll talk more about those in a later episode, maybe one of the live episodes so I can show them off. Thank you to everybody that has already sent me something. It is very sweet and very thoughtful. The fact that you guys reached out to me via the mail, besides via email and messages and everything about uh, Stitches Passing was very sweet. But the cards are deeply appreciated. I definitely thank you. But if you want to send me anything at all, send it on over to Paranormal Almanac or Kurt Sandvig, 1812 West Burbank Boulevard, number 7102, Burbank, California, 91506. I'll read that one more time. It's Paranormal Almanac or Kurt Sandvig, 1812 West Burbank Boulevard, number 7102, Burbank, California, 91506. And again, thank you to everybody that's already sent me something. It's been very sweet. I love I love popping in and checking on that stuff. All righty, like I said, we are back. There are a lot of curses out there. There are way more curses than just King Tut's tomb that I talked about or the Hope Diamond that I talked about on the last episode. So let's talk about some more archaeological curses. You got to start any good curse episode with a mummy. You just gotta. 
So, yeah, let, let's do that now. Now, this isn't an Egyptian mummy or tomb. This one belonged to, belongs to, I'll say belongs to, a 15th century Polish king named Casimir IV, Jaglan from Krakow, Poland. And in 1973, they said, well, we got to open this thing up. We got to see what's inside here because it probably hasn't been looted. So let's check it out. But just like with the opening of King Tut's tomb 50 years before that, the media had like, you know, the mummy or tomb fever and they really talked up the event. They said, this thing's going to be amazing. It's like kind of like, in, if you guys remember like Al Capone's vault or whatever that thing was, um, they were going to open it up and it was going to be amazing and tons of, you know, historical things and nothing happened. The press loves to talk about a good tomb opening. And in 1973, they talked this one up. Now, in the press, the researchers that were going to open up good old King Casimir's tomb, well, they even joked that they were risking a curse from the tomb by opening it. Kurt's tip of the day, if you're going to be opening a tomb in the near future, just don't joke about a curse. Don't bring it up. If somebody else brings it up, go, nah, I don't want to talk about a curse. Just don't do it. Okay, so they open it, all excited because, it, like I said, it probably hadn't been looted by the Russians from in World War II, and they were right. It wasn't. So they open it up, and that's when a very real killer was released. No, not the mummy of Casimir. No, this was the same killer as King Tut's curse. Its name? Aspergillus flavus, as well as Penicillin rub rum and... Penicillin Ragusalum. Sure, they're just bad. That's their bad. All three were released into the air, and they just so happen to produce aflatoxins. And together, they can be deadly when inhaled. Now, they could just cause, like, asthma or breathing problems in some, but can be, and in this instance, were very deadly to others. After just a few days, four of the 12 people in the group of archaeologists passed away after the tomb was opened. But during the next few years, many others died of cancer or other diseases. In total, 15 people who worked at the tomb or in the laboratories, working on what they took out of the tombs, died because of contact with the remains of King Casimir. So, yeah, the curse technically, is real because a hell of a lot of people died, 15 people, but, you know, some of those people might have gotten cancer from other things or just gotten cancer and it's just happened to be the people that worked on it or other diseases and just happened to work on it. Sure. But some of them died straight away because of the same toxins that came out of this tomb like they did out of King's Tut's, King Tut's tomb. So, First curse out of the gate, death toll is 15. I'm going to say, yeah, curse. All right, for the next curse, let's talk about the curse of mentioning politics on a podcast. Because some people think I talk about politics way too much on here. So, hey, guess what? This one, this one's for you. It's called the Curse of Tippecanoe, also known as Tecumseh's Curse or the more spoilerly name, like the name that spoils everything, the 20-year presidential curse. Now, I'm talking about American presidents, and because of the timing of presidential elections, these are also those taking place in the year ending with zero. So basically, you know, every four years we have a presidential election. In case you didn't know that, that's how America does it. But we're talking specifically about the ones ending with the year ending in zeros. So the 20-year presidential curse means that every 20 years that a president is elected with a year ending in zero, that president dies in office. Do they? Well, not really. But here's the ones that kind of fit this curse starting with William Henry Harrison, 1840, Abraham Lincoln, 1860, James Garfield, 1880, William McKinley, 1900, 
Warren Harding, 1920, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, 1940, John F. Kennedy, 1960, and then things kind of don't work out. Because the next one on that list for the curse was Ronald Reagan. Okay, now curse believers say, ah, but Ronald Reagan was seriously wounded by gunshots. Fun story. Um, I'm going to do a little side story here real quick. I might have told it on here before. I don't know. But um, I wanted to skip school. It was an elementary school, I believe. I was just, you know, I wanted to just watch daytime TV all day and skip school. I never really did it. I wanted to stay home, so I pretended I was sick. I said, Mom, I'm sick. I just want to stay home and watch TV all day. And she said, sure, go ahead, whatever. Don't bother. Um, that happened to be the day that Ronald Reagan was shot. So the only thing that was on TV all day was his dumb ass getting shot over and over again. Cause there's like five channels back then. And you know, instead of me watching crappy daytime TV, like price is right or whatever. Nope. It was Ronald Reagan getting shot news report about him getting shot over and over and over all day. It was the worst skip day ever. But back to the curse part of it, uh, in case you didn't know, Ronald Reagan survived. Um, so curse believers say, ah, but he almost died. He was, you know, it was an assassination attempt. So they're going to chalk that one up to it's still part of this 20-year curse. George W. Bush from 2000 was next on the list. Now, he survived his term in office, but did also have an assassination attempt, which sadly, for me anyway, I didn't really know anything about this assassination attempt. So in case you're like me who really didn't know anything about it, here's a quick recap of what happened with him. Ronald Reagan, he just got shot. Some guy walked up, shot. I don't know, I think it was like he loved Jodie Foster or something. I forget. But um, George Bush, May 10th, 2005. Artunian waited for the United States President George W. Bush and Georgian President Mikhail Sakajl doesn't matter, to uh, speak in um, Tbilisi Center, Liberty Square. Now, when Bush began speaking, Artunian threw a Soviet-made hand grenade wrapped in a red tartan handkerchief towards the podium where Bush stood as he addressed the crowd. The hand grenade landed 61 feet from the podium. It was right in front of where everybody was. But it failed to detonate. So first they thought, well, the hand grenade wasn't live. Nope. It was later revealed it really was a live hand grenade. But so Artunian, he pulls the pin, he throws the grenade. It hit a girl, cushioning its impact. And the red handkerchief remained wrapped up around the grenade and prevented the striker level from releasing. A Georgian security officer quickly removed the grenade. They got away. They were fine. Not they, but like... The president and the the two presidents got away, but he later said he threw the grenade towards the heads so that the shrapnel would fly behind the bulletproof glass. Bush and the other guy didn't even learn of the incident until after the rally. So that's some crazy shit right there. Um, I was old enough, 2005. I should have, I was out of school by then. I should have been made aware of this, but I had no idea about that one. So there you go. What is the next president to fit the description of this curse, though? Let's get back to that. Well, it's the current president, Joe Biden. Without commentary, that's who's next on the list. So what about presidents before people started noticing the pattern? Well, here they both are, and spoiler, they didn't die. Thomas Jefferson in 1800, James Monroe in 1820. So, even though... The curse basically stopped with Kennedy. People said, well, you know, Reagan, he had an assassination attempt. Then George W. Bush, he had an assassination attempt. And now we're on Joe Biden. That's it. That's all the politics. That's it. We're done. We made it. You guys made it through. But I will say I was very confused about why it was called Tecumseh's Curse. Well, in the 1930s, Ripley's, believe it or not, claimed the pattern was due to a curse that Chief Tecumseh placed on the head of Harrison and future presidents after Harrison's troops defeated Tecumseh at the Battle of Tippecanoe in 1811. Tecumseh died two years later in another battle against Harrison's troop. Now, this story has never been proven, and it's probably not true. So there you go. In case you were wondering why it's called Tecumseh's Curse, along with the Curse of Tippecanoe and the 20-Year Presidential Curse, 
That's why. So let me ask you a question. I'm going to ask the question early in this episode. Did Reagan surviving the assassination attempt? Because it was a freaking close one. He got shot square in the chest, close range, but he survived. Did the surviving, did he survive, him surviving, did it break the curse? I don't know. Let's just say yes and move on to the next curse on this episode. All right. Now, the next two, though, are the grain of salt times for this edition because it is really, really hard to find verifiable facts about them. Now, the first one is called the Karun Treasure. It's also known as the Croesus Treasure and the Lydian Horde. It's a 363-piece treasure. It dates back to the Iron Age and has a very bizarre history. So the treasure was basically it was found in Turkey. Then it was sold to the New York Metropolitan Museum of Art. Then a very, very lengthy lawsuit happened before it was returned back to the original country. Okay, so that's the very tiny Cliff's Note version of it. But let's get to the curse. Many, many, many sites say that the men who originally looted the treasure and also the men who illegally sold it, were all hit with great misfortune, including the deaths, mysterious deaths apparently, of three sons of one of the guys and the violent murder of another. But I can't find anything that confirms this. I do know that the director of the USAC Museum that sued New York and finally got the pieces back did blame the curse for his own misfortune. That part is true. Uh, his name was Kazem. He was arrested with 10 others. He admitted to selling some of the treasure to pay off gambling debts, and he was jailed for 13 years. And so, yep, of course, he blamed the curse for it. Now, the curse doesn't end there, though, because other people that have been involved with getting the treasure back say that the curse isn't a misfortune kind of a thing. It's more like like Lord of the Rings or the Hobbit or whatever, that once you touch the treasure, it consumes you. You get gold fever. You want to keep the treasure for yourself. You can't stop the lust for the treasure. So, another tip of the day, if you get a chance to touch a piece of the Karoon treasure, maybe don't do it. Maybe just don't do it instead. How about, how about that? All right, let's keep on moving on. Moving on to the next one that's the grain of salt one. It's the goddess of death. Now, it was supposedly unearthed in 1878. Now, I say supposedly because there is no confirmed record of that happening or the person that uncovered it, which is very rare for real things that are, you know, uncovered. Now, it, uh, the goddess of death, it dates to around 3500 BC. It's an ancient limestone statue and it was originally named the Woman of Lem after the town in the, Medi- in the Mediterranean island nation of Cyprus where it was discovered. But it's known by its better name, the Goddess of Death. Let me tell you all about this stuff. Eh, I'm just going to I'm just going to tell you. All right, so it's first owner, Lord Elfont. He was a uh, during the British colonial occupation of Cyprus, he was the very first owner of the Women of Lem. Now, within six years of buying the statue, he and seven members of his family passed away. Problem here, there is no record of a Lord Elfont at all. I mean, anywhere in the um, the records for, uh, for lords and ladies, nothing. In newspapers from the time. Nothing. Now, I'm not saying that just because I couldn't find him in an old newspaper doesn't mean he doesn't exist. Not everybody who's ever existed has been in the newspaper, but this was this was a big lord. This guy was big, and him and seven members of his family passed away. You'd think there'd be one article written about him. All right, let's see. So sometimes after sometime after that, Ivor Minucci obtained the statue in Europe. And he had a similar experience. His entire family died within four years. But, same thing. I can't find any records of Ivor Minucci. You Google Ivor Minucci, you're going to find some random crap. But, uh, you know, in, pertaining to this story, it's only websites that talk almost verbatim about this story. There is no other mentions about him, which is very, that's a huge red flag that he probably didn't exist. The third order, 
third owner, sorry, third owner was another lord, Thompson Knoll. Nope. Nothing. No registries, no nothing. But apparently his old family uh, perished within four years as well. The statue eventually ended up as the property of Sir Alan Biverbrook, or Biverbrook. And shortly after he acquired it, his wife and their two daughters died. His two remaining sons said, nope, I don't want this freaking thing. And they donated the statue to the Royal Scottish Museum in Edinburgh. Okay. Once it gets to the Museum of Edinburgh, the museum's curator who handled the statue died within a year. Or did they? Because problem here as well. Uh, they, they say that the statue's still there. It's still, you can still see it. It's either locked in a glass case in the museum. No one's allowed to touch it. Or that it is in their archives of the museum because it's so deadly and no one's allowed to touch it. You have to wear gloves when you clean it, that kind of crap. All right, here's the problems. No records of Lord Thompson Knoll or Sir Alan Biverbrook. The fact that he is a sir, the other guy's a lord, both of these guys should be in registries, should be able to find something about them. Nothing. And... An online search of the natural of the National Museums of Scotland's archives doesn't show the Woman of Lem statue in its inventory. So, it's there's a lot of photos of this statue out there, tons of photos of it. It does look like it's in a case in some kind of museum. So what I did was I emailed the museum. I sent an email to the National Museums of Scotland. And guess what? A woman that works there has absolutely no idea what I was talking about. She then referred me to her curatorial team. They said, what? No, but we'll look into it. And we're kind of like laughing about it in the email. So if I get a follow-up response to this one, I will let everyone know. But from everything that I can find out as of today, it isn't with the National Museums of Scotland. It did not kill the museum curator when it was donated to it. And none of the people connected to this story seems to be real. So way to go, hundreds of other podcasts and websites talking about this one. I think I even talked about this one in the past, but this one, this time I did it really trying to investigate and really trying to figure it out. So yeah, everything I can find about this one. I'm calling bullshit on this one. All righty, up next, let's get the Titanic involved. No, not that curse of the unsinkable ship or the fire on board or the theory that it wasn't the Titanic that even sank. Nope, none of that. This one's about a mummy, kind of. It's known as the unlucky mummy, which is frankly the worst kind of mummy to be. But sadly, there isn't even a mummy at all. It is either a painted wood mummy board of a couple of different things or a mummy of a couple of different things. There's actually a bunch of versions of this story. So let me just go down the list. First one, a sarcophagus of an ancient Egyptian king was being smuggled to New York by a black market art dealer. He was going to sell it to a museum in New York for $500,000 in 1912. He would give a portion of the money to the thieves that stole it from the tomb. Now, the curse said the sarcophagus was cursed, because that's how you get a curse. But when it was smuggled aboard the Titanic, it's what caused the ship to sink. That's version one. Version two, the mummy is that of a priestess or a princess of Amun-Ra. Basically, it's the same after that. Curse, iceberg sinks, mummy ends up at the bottom of the sea. Or in other stories... It is an actual board. It's a wooden board of a mummy that you, know, you kind of like take it off the mummy top top of the mummy if you get a mummy. So it's the mummy board itself and not the mummy. And it was rescued in a lifeboat. And once it arrived in New York, anyone who came near it fell under its curse. In one version, the mummy made an attempted return to Egypt on the ship of the Empress of Ireland, which sank, and then made a second attempt aboard the Lusitania, which sank. Look, there's basically, there are so many versions of this story. So, where's the kernel of truth? Are any of them true? Nope. Not, not one. Stop 
writing about this one websites and podcasts. It's bullshit. Do a little bit of research. Look, this thing's been going around forever before podcasts and the internet. Books wrote about it. In 1970, books were written about it. Um, 1973, The Curse of the Pharaoh. It mentions that the mummy, this is the princess version. Then in uh, Unearthing Atlantis in 1991, this version, it's a queen's mummy. Now, some sources say that they found the origin of the story itself. So there is technically a kernel of truth to the story, even though it's still bullshit. But I don't know if this story is even true. Some sources say that the legend originated in the press just days after the Titanic sank. Now, it did appear in newspapers at the time, but it may have been concocted on the decks of the ship itself. One of the ship's passengers, William Thomas Steed, who was a uh, journalist, but he was also big into like spiritualism and mysticism and loved mediums, basically knew how to tell a good tale, how to spin a yarn. So he had been warned by a spiritualistic friend, um, Mr. Penny, not to make the ocean journey. So he relayed this to several people over dinner on the third night of the Titanic's voyage. Now, he decided to ramp up the story a little bit and also talk about a mummy's curse associated with the mummy's case on exhibit at the British Museum and currently held by the museum, pictured below, it's right there. Um, so there really is this mummy board kind of thing. And he said, well, he just kind of connected. He made up a story about it. After the ship sank, some say he died with the ship, some of the surviving listeners who were at the table started to, you know, telling the tale. This guy said it was going to sink, and he was, there was a big whole thing about a mummy as well. But there was no mummy aboard the Titanic. That last bit is very important. No mummy aboard the Titanic. Um, also, how crappy would it be about the version of, like, you know, they, they found it floating and they pulled it up onto a lifeboat? How crappy is that, that they, they find it from, you know, like a lifeboat... One of the survivors finds it and they rescue it from the waters instead of like Leo. Come on, guys. Ooh, wait. Here we go. I'm actually going to add to the story once again. So that uh, that piece of wood that Rose is floating on at the end of Titanic, that's the actual mummy board itself. James Cameron actually got it on loan from that museum for that scene. There you go. There's your new twist to a very lame curse that isn't even real with a just a little bit of research. I was able to debunk this story as well. All right, up next is a weirder one, which is a bold statement because the curse episodes are always weird. It's a cursed song. Now, it's a song that causes people to commit suicide. Warning Right now, I'm going to play a snippet of the song in a bit. So if this topic is sensitive to you, skip ahead like maybe a minute or so. I'll try and breeze through it in a minute. But I just want to give you guys a warning because I know that it's a very sensitive topic and I'm with you on that. Now, the song is called Gloomy Sunday. and It was composed by Hungarian pianist and composer Rezo Saras. And it was published in 1933 and then recorded in Hungarian by Pal Kalmar in 1935 and then became world known after the release of a version by Billie Holiday in 1941. The alleged increases in suicides in the 30s associated with the playing of this song is the curse. So people were found dead of suicide, and this song was on their record. The record player had played it and had stopped by that point. So people started to notice that more and more of these people committing suicide seem to be listening to this song. And there kind of was something to it. But you have to remember, though, this was also, you know, around the Great Depression. It was a very popular song, so everybody had a copy of it. And it's a very kind of depressing song as well. So press reports in the 1930s associated at least 19 suicides, both in Hungary and America. All of them had this song playing. Then, in January of 1968, what is that, like 30-something, 30 35 years later, whatever it is, after the writing of the song, Rezo Saras, the guy that, you know, Hungarian pianist and composer himself, committed suicide. 
Now, he survived jumping out of a window in Budapest, but later in the hospital, choked himself to death with a wire. So, it, uh, it was bad. It was really bad for this song. It was so bad, in fact, that in 1941, the BBC actually banned Billie Holiday's version from being broadcast because they felt it was detrimental to wartime morale and it was also connected to all of these suicides. So let's just ban the song. That song actually was banned by the BBC from 1941 all the way until 2002. All right, here's the lyrics, and then I'll play a snippet of it. Sad Sunday with a hundred white flowers. I was waiting for you, my dear, with temple prayer. Dreaming of a Sunday morning, my sorrow has returned without you swinging. Since then, Sundays have always been sad. Tears are just my drink, bread, my grief. Gloomy Sunday. Last Sunday, my dear, come. There will also be a priest, a coffin, a funeral home, a mourning cloth. You can also expect flowers, flowers, and coffins. My journey under flowering trees is the last. My eyes will be open to see you again. Don't be afraid to bless me dead. Last Sunday. So, yeah, I mean, it's a gloomy freaking song. But, like I said, I'm actually a little bit past a minute. If you still wanted to not hear this song, skip ahead another minute, 30 seconds or so, because I'm about to play a snippet of the song that will not play right now. The curse is that I can't get the damn song to play. All right, that's about enough of that song. You can you can find it online. There is a video that plays the song and then tells you some stories about some of the deaths. Um, I found that not all of that is exactly accurate, but like I said, there were 19 or so suicides connected to it. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a sad song. It's a very depressing sounding song, but it's insane to me that it was actually banned by the BBC from 1941 until 2002. All righty guys. If you wanted to skip that one, don't worry. We're, we're good. We can, we're moving on finally on this edition. Let's talk about Valentino's cursed ring. It's a very interesting story. It's about Rudolph Valentino's cursed ring. And this one also, I did a little research and reached out to somebody who supposedly still owns the ring, and I've not heard back yet. I'm going to keep reaching out to her or even call her next week and see if I can find out some more info. But um, it's called the Destiny Ring. So Rudolph Valentino, in case you guys didn't know, he was a big star in Hollywood back in the day. Now, he found the ring in a San Francisco shop. And he loved it. It's a simple silver ring. It has a tiger eye stone in the center of it. Said he had to have it. So he buys it. Uh, Again, this is like the 1920s. So he's in a sensation. He loves everything about it. But right after he buys the ring, his career kind of tanks. So he has a big flop. Then he makes another movie. It flops. And he dies Supposedly, as the stories go, he dies wearing the ring at only 31. Now, he did die because of an infection after having surgery for bleeding ulcers. So, not really, the curse wasn't really real to me yet. But the ring was then passed on to actress Pola Negri, um, who immediately fell ill. Supposedly, right after she got the ring, she fell ill. Now, she did recover But again, just like Valentino, her career kind of died. So she's like, all right, this is weird. I don't want this thing anymore. And she passes the ring to a singer named Russ Columbo. Apparently because he reminded her of Valentino. He gets the ring. Very shortly afterwards, he dies in a shooting accident. 
So then the ring goes from there to Columbo's friend, Joe Casino. Now, Casino put the ring under glass, but he, because, you know, he knew about the curse, but it was also because it was Rudolph Valentino's ring. But he decides to actually wear it one time. Apparently, and I can't guarantee you that it was the only time he ever wore it, but apparently he was wearing it, he was out and about, and he was in a fatal hit and run by a truck. Everybody's going, oh crap, there is something to this ring curse. And his brother Dell inherits it. He locks it away in a safe in his house. But it was actually stolen by a man named James Willis who set off an alarm in the house. And when police arrived on the scene, they shot Willis and killed him. Guess what was inside his pocket at the time? That's right, the ring. Now, a lot of sites say it was only the ring. That's not true. He was literally trying to rob a very rich man and had a bunch of his shit. But the ring was the important part of it. Ring was placed back in the safe. Next up to get the ring is director Edward Small. So he wanted to make a movie about Valentino, and he hired this guy named Jack Dunn to portray Valentino and had him actually wear the real ring. But two weeks later, Dunn dies. I can't really find out what he died of. A lot of sites just say blood disease, but it seems pretty vague. All righty, so now the ring is in a vault in a Los Angeles bank. Here's where the grain of salt comes in. As soon as the ring arrives in this Los Angeles bank's vault, the bank has numerous robbery attempts. Then it has an employee strike. Then it has a fire. Then they don't really know what happened to the ring. People think that it might have gotten stolen successfully from the bank or it might have just been sold and passed along. Uh, let's see. Alex Wax told Ripley's Believe It or Not, he doesn't know exactly where the ring came from or where it is now. More on that in a second. He says, I believe the actual events took place, however. I don't believe the ring is cursed. I believe it's, I don't believe in curses. I think it's just a string of unfortunate incidents from people attached to a physical object. Despite the fact I don't believe in curses, it's quite a remarkable sequence of events, and I don't blame anyone for believing in them. The timing is just too eerie. So, here's the thing. These deaths do appear to be real and do appear to be connected to people that have recently come in contact with the ring. So where is it now? Well, I found this really interesting comment on a site about the ring. And it was a guy who says, I know where the ring is or was as of five years ago. This man, I'm not going to say his name, obtained it from this guy who had it on display in his shop before giving it to him. This guy, the, co the commenter, said, I saw the ring. Now, the man died of natural causes. Now, his wife is refusing, to my, refusing my contacts regarding the ring. He said, I was a pallbearer at his funeral. I inquired about the vanished ring until I was not welcome. So, I reached out to the widow of this man that this guy is writing about. And I asked about the ring. There does seem to be some truth to her husband owning the ring. Where is the ring now? I don't know, but I'm still in contact with her. Like I said, I'm going to call her. Um, I, I contacted her via email, not getting any more responses. So I'm going to call her to find out where the ring is now. But it does seem... Like, this might be true. Like, she might still own Valentino's ring. Now, I don't want Valentino's ring, but I would love to talk to her about it. How long her husband had it before he passed away. What she plans on doing with it. Is it really Valentino's ring? Because if it is, it's probably worth a shit ton of money. But uh, a very interesting possible update to a ring that nobody's technically seen for years. So hopefully it'll something will come of it. If it does, I'll be sure to tell you guys all about that because I would love to be a small part in the Rudolph Valentino ring story because I love old Hollywood. You guys know that from me. I absolutely love old Hollywood and I thought it was very neat. All righty. That about does it for this episode on Cursed Objects. 
I think I did this on the last episode about cursed objects, so I'm going to do it again. What do I think of curses now? Do I believe in them more or less than I did? No. Do I believe in curses? I think things can be cursed. I think some bad juju can be connected to an object. But I think that people are looking for curses when they find out things are cursed or looking for bad things to happen once they find out about curses. So I don't necessarily believe that a lot of these, a couple of them I debunk straight away or grain of salt did straight away, but the ones that I couldn't debunk, I don't know. I definitely wouldn't open up a tomb without, you know, a respirator on, I can tell you that. But is that really a curse if it's scientifically proven what killed these people? Yeah, these people died as a result of opening the tomb, and the tomb, the curse says if you open the tomb, you're going to die. So I guess that curse is validated, but... I don't know, man. I just keep going around in my brain. Is it really a curse if it's been proven? But it is proven to be true. So the curse was true. So is it really a curse? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, it's like one of those like questions you ask a robot in a 60s sci-fi movie. So they brain pops. You know, that's what just keeps happening. It just keeps going around in circles in my brain. I don't know what to think about curses. There's a lot of deaths connected. to. There's a lot of deaths connected to Rudolph Valentino's ring. There's a you know, 15 deaths associated with the very first one, the opening of that Polish king's tomb. So these deaths are real. Crazy shit is happening, connecting to these curses, but, or these objects. I don't know. I guess that's my response. I have no idea. What do you guys think? Are curses real? Can a curse still be a curse if science can explain it? I don't know. You tell me. Once again, I'm your host, Kurt Sandvig, and uh, I want to thank you all once again real quick before I let you all go. Thank you all once again for reaching out. I truly, truly do appreciate it. You guys have got me through a rough, rough time. Uh, there will be more episodes coming up very, very soon. Hopefully another um, interview episode is coming up very soon. I'm very excited about this one, if it pans out. I don't want to tell you who it is in case it doesn't pan out, but hopefully it pans out. Once again, I'm your host, Kurt Sandvig, and this has been another edition of Paranormal Almanac. Skull the gums it. Sir gums.